welcome dear students and respected viewers to a discussion about the 12th night or what you will one of shakespeare's most popular comedies and we shall be looking at the verbal felicity of the play for which it is most remarkable and also add the characterization the art of characterization and the main characters of the play as far as comedy is concerned verbal felicity compensates for many other things that are not possible for a comedy writer to achieve in tragedy in a tragedy with some comic interest in a play full of action action deeds fulfill a particular vacuum in comedy it is not possible to have action on the same level of intensity as we have it in a tragedy the result is that a very successful comedy writer like shakespeare always tries to compensate for it by verbal felicity what form does verbal felicity take in the 12th night or what you will we can study it under three heads wit one two humor three a predominant lyrical strain in the play now as far as wit and humor is concerned it is found in every comedy and whoever is the writer because no comedy can be can exist without wit and humor but here is a comedy like other shakespearean comedies which is remarkable for its wit and humor but which is distinguished by the predominance of a lyrical strain of music it seems that shakespeare is at the best of his music at the best of his melody in this play now first of all we we'll look at its wit and humor it seems the whole emphasis falls here on these three distinct dimensions of verbal felicity all characters even the minor characters like maria all characters take recourse to wit and humor the play begins with a pun pun on heart h a r t and pun uh, uh, and the the other word which is pronounced like that h e a r t and immediately after that when viola is referring to her brother cesario viola viola disguised now as cesario when she is referring to her brother and believing that he has been drowned and he she has lost him for good they tell him that this is illyria and she says what shall i do with illyria when my brother is in elysium this kind of punning on words continues throughout another speech that immediately follows this is valentine's speech where he is punning again and again and again on word continue when viola cesario that is viola disguised as cesario is sent by duke orsino for the first visit to lady olivia's court and when he reaches there and after initial hesitancy olivia unveils her face and says how do i look because olivia has started harboring sentiments of love towards cesario viola thinking that it is a boy when she first unveils her face and says how do i look viola says excellently done if god did all now this is a reminiscent of so many other great speeches in in various plays that is she is referring to the fact that god may not be the author of all that beauty that beauty may owe something to the makeup to which lady olivia has taken recourse so she says simple words excellently done if god did all the clown who is one of the important minor characters not a major character but important among the minor characters the clown speeches are throughout 
charge it with wit. He puns on words. So he's, he, whatever he says always carries a double meaning, one which he intends, the other which perhaps the listener takes. Similarly, one particular dimension of the plot which we believe is Shakespeare's special contribution, the creation of a particular figure who has become a part of literary thinking right from the day when he was created, like Falsetoff, like Lady Macbeth, like Iago, like Edmund, like Lear. This one character has become, although he is not a tragic character, Malvolio. And because there are Malvolios among us, he has become as famous in literature as Don Quixote of Cervantes, because he has those traits in him which are with the difference of degree found more or less in each one of us. And so we can, in that mirror, we can see that sordid aspect that is contained by almost all human personality. What is that sordid aspect? That you always feel that you are more important than anyone else. That, always, that you always feel that others should always admire you and adore you. That is Malvolio. But he is held up to ridicule. He is played, a trick is played upon him by Maria, one of the minor characters here, together with Sir Toby and Andrew Eggcheek. They send a forged letter to him, Malvolio, and that letter is deliberately written in the hand of Lady Olivia, and he is made to believe that Lady Olivia loves him, and, and she wants him to dress in a particular manner, and she wants him to smile in a particular manner, and after that, poor man, he starts wearing the same dress which has been recommended in the letter. He starts placing artificial smiles upon his lips and makes himself a butt of ridicule and ultimately is declared to be mad and put in a dark room. Now this, the whole episode, he is so full of wit, although one has sometimes the feeling that, that Malvolio is treated a little too harshly. But the whole episode is so full of wit and humor that it gives us peals of laughter everywhere. But more important than, than the wit and than the humor that predominates this play is the lyrical strain which distinguishes it. As I said, that Shakespeare's, Shakespeare seems to be at his most melodious here, at his most musical here. And Twelfth Night is one of those plays of Shakespeare which has given to people quotations, quotable quotations, so many of them, quotable quotations, that we go on repeating some of them. Some of them have entered English language, and they have become a part of English language. And when something becomes the part of a lingua franca, a language that is spoken by common men, it also determines our thinking. This music, this melody, this quotable melodious speeches, which are interspersed throughout the play. In fact, any, open any page, open any speech, you will find instances of this. This distinguishes Twelfth Night. It begins with it. The very first line which is spoken by Duke Arsino is, if music be the food of soul, play on. And this is the key. If music be the food of soul, play on. And from this, Point onwards, you have music all around, melody all around. I'll, I'll just give you two instances. Viola is disguised as Cesario, and she is serving Duke Orsino. And when Orsino says that Olivia is not listening to his pleas of love, she starts telling him her own story. She says, my father had a daughter, which is she, in fact, but Orsino does not know that because she is in disguise. She says, my father had a daughter. She also pined for someone, and that someone was unaware. And then he asks us for further details. He says, what is the history of that sister of yours? There's no sister. She herself is referring to herself. She says, no history, sir. And then she says, and I'm, I quote, a blank, my lord. So what is, what is the history of your sister? She says, a blank, my lord. She never told her love. We know that she cannot tell her love because she is disguised as a boy. 
obviously the situation is like that that she cannot reveal her love but look at the lines and look at the melody and look at the music a blank melody she never told her love but let concealment like a worm in the bud feed on her damask cheek if we remember that shakespeare is using damask as an adjective and damask is a rose which is exquisitely where white and pink is exquisitely combined and she says that her damask cheek was eaten up by a worm the whole speech all the lines that follow this beginning are very marvelously couched in words and the play ends as it begins on a musical string on a lyrical string towards the end when olivia enters the court of duke orsino the things have been revealed the whole thing has been very uh, is now very clear and he knows that 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 viola is actually a girl and not cesario and when when the countess enters his court he says here comes the countess now heaven walks on earth and it goes on apart from the verbal felicity which distinguishes the 12th night 12th night is also remarkable for its marvelous characterization indeed there is no shakespeare play which is not remarkable which is not distinguished for its marvelous characterization but here shakespeare almost delights in character portraying there are theme that there is a thematic interest predominant thematic interest love treated in its light hearted manner love treated as a light emotional exercise the thematic possibilities are known to shakespeare but he does not elaborate they are hinted at the thematic possibilities but not elaborated whereas shakespeare's whole creative fervor here goes into the making of brilliant character portrayals and that is what the play is noteworthy for and from this point of view all its major characters are remarkable let us have a look at the three most important characters of the play duke orsino lady olivia and malvolio duke orsino is presented in the play as an idealist in the realm of love not a practical man not a man who knows the brass tacks who knows the difficulties of life who knows only that love is one dimension of life but a person who has abandoned himself to the idea of love i say that he is an idealist in the love because he is more in love with the idea of loving than lady olivia he is so much consumed by love presented as such he is presented in a manner that he is consumed by love so much consumed by love that all other aspects of his personality are concealed from our view very slight hints are dropped here and there that he could be a good administrator because people speak very high of him because we see him towards the end when antonio the sailor is produced before him by the officers of justice and he is told that this is the person against whom a case is pending in the court and we see that he begins to take action and take action very competently and at about this time also we we when he suspect cesario viola that is viola this guy that is cesario when he suspects that she has herself as a boy won the heart of olivia he takes a decision a very harsh decision he says that i'll punish this boy he has been he has been very dear to me he has been serving me i have given him a very serious employment but look here what he is doing he has gone to the court of olivia and he has won her heart and he decides to chastise him to punish him but at that time the whole thing is revealed the tangle is disentangled the puzzle is revealed and uh, he does not punish her but the fact remains that at that time we begin to see that he is really a competent administrator 
that as people say that he is a very good ruler, he is a very good ruler. Olivia is almost a pun because Olivia appears in the beginning very stern, very resolute. She has taken a resolution. Her brother is dead. That brother was very dear to her. Therefore, she is resolved that for several long years she will have no truck with men. And for several long years she will stay in seclusion. And she will keep her face behind a veil. And it seems that she is very, very, very stern. So that Duke Arsino refers to her as sovereign cruelty. And when Viola, disguised as Cesario, visits her on behalf of her master, Arsino, she says, she calls her fair cruelty. That is, you are an embodiment of cruelty. Here is a man of whom everyone speaks very highly. He is considered to be a virtuous person, a kind person, a sympathetic person. And he has been pleading with, and he is the duke, he is the ruler of Illyria. And he has been pleading with her to accept him as a future husband. And Olivia refuses. She calls him, Viola calls him fair cruelty. That is the beginning. But when she looks at the face of Viola disguised as a boy, as Cesario, Olivia falls. Her own resolu whole resolution, whole determination seems to be like ice which melts at the first sight of charming youth. And then she starts pursuing that youth. She started pleading with that youth to accept her as his hus husband. And then when ultimately Sebastian appears and she thinks Sebastian is perhaps Viola, she marries Sebastian. And even when she comes to know that it is not Viola, it is Viola's brother Sebastian, there is no surprise. It is as if something has happened very naturally and she has accepted it. So a puzzle is created. What is she? Is she a stern and resolute lady? Or is she a lady who melts just at the first sight of youth? Perhaps the dramatist seems to tell us this is human nature. Appearances may be deceptive. And you can never define a man or a woman in final terms. In terms about it, you feel that there's nothing wrong about it. Man can, in one moment, you are one thing. In another moment, you may, you may be a different thing. Of course, you have a particular character. But then there are fluctuations. There are ups and downs. And this is human nature. Human nature is so complex, so mysterious, that man ultimately remains undecipherable. And Shakespeare knew it very well. He knew it. His sonnets tell us he knew it. His tragic plays tell us he knew it. And here in the comic world, he gives us a figure who is so puzzling, so complex, so mysterious, that it's very difficult to define. But she is, at the same time, a very competent administrator. Even though we are shown only Olivia as a lover, but there are occasions when she treats her servants, when she actually takes offense at the behavior of her uncle, Sir Toby, and Andrew Egg Cheek, when she ultimately decides that Malvolio should be put in a dark room. At such occasions, it seems that she is a very competent, very sympathetic, very understanding administrator. The third important character of the Twelfth Night is Malvolio. And as I said before, he has become one of the memories, the unerasable unerase memories that literature has bequeathed to us. He belongs to that gallery of characters who have become immortal because he represents a particular dimension of human nature. Actually, he is in service with Lady Olivia as her steward, in charge of looking after her estates and in charge of looking after her household. But at one particular time, somebody puts it into his air, into his mind, that Lady Olivia thinks highly of him and may ultimately decide to marry him. Now, without considering his status in life, 
without considering the fact that he is subordinate to Lady Olivia, just one, uh, one, of her, one of her servants, he begins to harbor the ideas, the dream, the aspiration that at one time he will become the owner, the master of the whole estate, which now belongs to Countess Olivia. Now, at this time, a trick is played upon him. Sir Toby, Andrew Eggchi, who owes some grudge to him, use a particular woman in service with Lady Olivia, Beria. Beria's hand resembles the hand of Olivia. So they ask Beria to write a letter to, to him, to Malvolio, and leave it on the way so that he picks it up and he begins to feel. Don't write any name, but just the hand should deceive him. He, he should feel that Lady Olivia is in love with him and she has written the letter. And this lands him into a very ridiculous situation. First of all, he begins to dress and talk and smile in such a way which has been recommended in the letter. And finally, when the lady tells him what has happened to you, have you, have you been turned mad? Have you gone mad? And finally, he decides and asks the very same people who are the authors of his ridiculous situation. The very same people are asked to take him and put him in a dark room until his madness goes. And finally, he writes a letter complaining that he had been misled to believe in something. And Malvolio has become a part of that immortal gallery of personages which have come to us from the world of literature, from the world of fiction, from the world of Shakespearean drama. This should conclude the introduction of the way of approaching Twelfth Night. But it depends upon the student now, at taking hints from these various approaches, from the various ways in which the play could be approached. He goes to the play itself, reads the play properly, and if possible, sees a film version or a theatrical performance of the play in order to take, derive the best out of it. With this, we conclude the discussion. Thank you very much.